Who has heard of RxJS before? All right, I think that's the lowest number of hands we've got up so far. Um, Is that because of the, 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 the meetup description or because you knew it? Right. <laughs> All right. Um, so from those hands, who has actually used RxJS? Okay. <laughs> Okay, this is good. Um, so what I wanted to do is introduce RxJS at sort of a um, beginner level, how to get started with it, and some of the nuances that I learned when I was getting started with it. And if you go online and you start learning about RxJS, it seems like many of the tutorials, many of the uh, examples are kind of, they assume a lot about RxJS. They're already kind of experts in what's happening under the hood, and they're showing you how to tie things together and do these really amazing, complex things that are really short to describe in a reactive programming language, but they're assuming you know what uh, is happening under the hood. And I keep seeing on uh, static overflow the, the questions about why isn't this working, and it's because the fundamental level of what are you building together isn't understood. Um, so that's what I want to get into, is how do you start with the uh, basic building blocks of RxJS? And I'm Ian, I'm from DigitalOcean, and I've used RxJS to build a metrics pipeline in the past where we've got servers which are collecting metrics, um, kind of if you've used CollectD before, um, and they're pulling these servers, all these uh, individual servers, so a server of servers. Um, and if you use CollectD, it's kind of meant for just pulling one MySQL instance on that server or one application on that server. It's not really built for pulling 100 different services which all have different varieties of CPU network it's the, and it's all changing as well. You're adding and subtracting services as you go. Uh, Collective is kind of meant for, you know what you're pulling, you're pulling at a regular interval and so building a new metrics pipeline was useful and um, first off how that matters is RxJS is kind of about streams of data. Things come in, you can compose them together so how this metrics pipeline is kind of a stream of data is You've got one service, uh, you want to pull its CPU, that pulls every five seconds, and you've got the stream of these like CPU data points every five seconds, and you've got this for 100 servers that can be going up and down. You don't know how many streams you might have at a time, but in the end, you all want these data points to go to one place. You want to compose all the data points as they come together into one output, and RxJS makes that really easy. So let's get some terminology, and I'll make this big for now. So we've got observables, we've got observers, and we've got the operations that we can do between the two things. So if we've got so something that we're observing and uh, the observers that we have, we can do transformations in between them. And that's what RxJS is really powerful at giving you and why I think it's a little difficult to get started because they give you so much without teaching you where it came from. And then, so they have observers, observable operations, and then finally, subject. They break their pattern for naming. Um, observables. This is a stream. This is a sequence. It's very much like an array over time. It's kind of like a lazy evaluation of array. It's, you've got values, and you don't know exactly when they're going to be happening, but RxJS guarantees you a couple things. It's only going to happen one at a time, which is actually really, it's hard to do that outside of JavaScript anyways, but um, another thing about just uh, Reactive X, uh, this library is RxJS is the JavaScript implementation of it, and there's the same tooling for Python, for Java, and you can learn these terminologies and bring them to other languages as well. So the guarantee is only one value will happen at a time. Um, and errors and completion are values. If uh, midway through processing a stream of events, the stream needs to die, it failed, there was an error. It's built into this thing called an observable that you can have an error. Or when it completes, it comes to the end, it's successful and there's no more data, it's just gonna be done. And then someone needs to look at that data, those are called observers, and it's a really simple API. It's an object in JavaScript which has three functions, on next, on error, and on complete. So let's get into the code. I am going to be spending lots of time just in between code. Um, I wanted to play around with this kind of live because it's really interesting to see how things change as you, you look at the code and you change a little thing and see how it, it uh, reacts differently. So the first thing we have is our observer. Um, so first off, 
I'm just, I, I got kind of heavy into the, trying the uh, new ES6 stuff. I'm using let pretty much everywhere. Um, don't worry about that. We've just got Rx. We're importing that. And um, it has an observer subclass area. And it's got a create method. And what it takes as its first argument is a function, which is your on next. Uh, the second argument is on error. And then finally, it has an on completed. And what is interesting about why this is better than just a few different functions and Apple actually wrapping that in this observer object is it's got some built-in guarantees. If you build an observer and your caller is being naughty, say you're calling this uh, yourself right here saying, uh, I've got a stream. First, it has a one on the value. Then it's got a two. And then I'm completing the stream. The stream is done. It has no more. But then I'm going to send an error as well. You actually won't see that error. It, it breaks the contract. If you have a complete or an error, then the stream is done, and you won't have any more values, and the observer builds that in for you so you don't accidentally shoot yourself in the foot later. So we will run that 01 observer. So there we go. Um, we've got on next one, on next two, and on completed. And even though we ran this on error, it didn't show up. But we can change the order really quick. And we'll just see that that we get on air and no on completed. The on air ends the stream. So let's go on to our observable. Um, similar pattern. We have Rx. We've got the observable, and it's got the create function. And this takes a function of an observer. So how this was just creating an observer which had these three functions. We're now passing an observer into this observable. As you create it, it will be receiving something that has those three methods. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to call those methods on this observer that we were given when we created this observable. And we'll do it asynchronous, asynchronously now. We'll say in one second, we'll have on next. In two seconds, we'll complete it. And this is our observer here, same logic as we had before. It's on next, on error, complete. We're just going to log it. One second, on next, on completed. And one nice little thing you get if you are setting timeouts or you're doing things that might need to be garbage collected or taken care of afterward the fact, um, returning a function from this create function. This is executed when the observable is terminated. So whenever there is a on complete, on error, then this code is terminated. So if you're wrapping up like a database connection, you're wrapping up a WebSocket, and you need to tear that down when you're done listening to it, when the observable is finished, you can do that right here. So you will hardly ever see observer.create in code or examples online. Um, it's always wrapped in this subscribe method, which I forgot to admit. This is what ties the observer to, uh, this is what injects the observer right here when we subscribe to it, observable.subscribe and observer. But you don't actually need to declare an observer outside. Usually, you'll do something like this. And we'll just pass in one function. Um, and this is our console.log on next. So we get our on next, and I didn't pass a on complete into the subscribe method, so we don't see that showing up here. But the cleanup still happened. It was done. And what you're doing when you see this code all around RxJS examples is you're actually creating an observable object. It survives there. And there's also a return to this function, and that is called, um, there's another type called disposable. Everything's a disposable type. And this is our subscription. And let's do something where we stop, we stop listening to the observable before it even has a chance to give us anything. So we'll say a subscription. And we'll dispose it. And we'll run this again. And it's done. We didn't get anything because it took one second to even get to on next and on completed. And as soon as we created our subscription to an observable, we disposed it and completed. So this is very similar to event emitter code that we see in Node. Um, 
But some of the stuff we don't get with event emitter is how do you handle when there is an error? And I've seen plenty of event emitter code in Node that has something like a next, like a data event, um, something that you're consuming the actual um, content of the emitter, and then metadata stuff. And it's usually something to say an error or it's just done. And so I like RxJS in that it wraps it up in an API that's consistent and it's very well uh, descriptive of what you want when you're taking data over time. Um, and this is where we get tricky with observables is this right here, after saying rxobservable.create, it has all the functions of, of an observable. You can subscribe to it, you can do these operations like map, you can um, all these operators which we'll get to next, but it doesn't exist until you subscribe to it. It's kind of that question, it's like if uh, an observable falls in the woods and there's no observer to hear it, does it make a sound? No, it doesn't. In our yes, an observer won't get created until someone actually cares about it, uh, which can be confusing because it also means if you subscribe to an observer twice, you create two different observables. Um, this is really just a definition for an observable. This is a definition for a stream of data. So if you're um, coming from the node land where you're kind of used to event emitters, where this object here, I can have many things subscribed to it, and I send one event and it broadcasts out, and you come to RxJS land and you create your observable, which looks very much like that, and you create uh, two um, observers. And what I've done here is I've got this ID field outside of the observable, and we're gonna just increase that as I uh, get a new observer and run this, and we'll see that we get two different observables. So we've got uh, observer one, observer two. Observer one is observing observable one. Observer two is observing observable two. Uh, they get the same data because the definition of the code is the same, but they're two distinct objects. So what if we want something more like the event emitter? And that's built in. We can uh, call publish. Um, what publish does is it says you kind of want a single object that many people can subscribe to. What is confusing about it is now it doesn't know, it, you're kind of breaking away from um, who it subscribed to, and it won't actually make any data if you just say publish. It is in a broadcast mode, but these uh, subscription calls are no longer tied to it very well. It needs to know, you need to tell it when it should start publishing, because before this, was, this is what was instantiating the object, and now it can't guarantee that an observable observer being there or not is going to instantiate the object. So you need to do that yourself. You need to say, and that's called a connection. Let connection equal uh, publish dot connect. And this is actually going to be the thing that creates this observable and everything else will be observing this as it happens. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> that live coding lifestyle. Thank you. There we go, okay. So now we've got observer one, observer two. They're getting the same values, but they're both observing observable one. No new observable was created. Um, so that's pretty handy, but now I have to manage this connection, and I also have to dispose of it if I want to get rid of this observable, I can uh, kill the connection. This is kind of like my subscription before, where I had a subscription uh, when I subscribed. Now I've got a subscription off of the connection. I can destroy that. Dispose. And then it ends, because we disposed the connection after it was able to run. So there's one more piece that we can try if uh, you're daring, and that's called ref count and you tack that onto a publish, and what that does is it kind of turns it back into the subscribe mode where it gets created 
when you subscribe it, but it only creates the observable on the first subscriber and it keeps it alive as long as there's at least one subscriber there. And if all the subscribers go away individually, then the observable dies. And then if you subscribe again, it creates an entirely new one, which can be very prone for bugs if you're not expecting that behavior. So this is the whole thing between, if you go into the documentation, a hot observable and a cold observable is, is this. If you are currently in publish or ref count where you've got like a single observable and many people can connect to it, that's a hot observable. It, uh, no matter if people are listening to it, it's sending data. You may not care about it. A cold observable is it's only ever going to be created and its life will end if there's no one listening to it. All right. Any questions so far on observables, by the way? All right, we'll get back. Operations. OK, so now we've got a way to create streams of data, a way to look at them. This is where it's really cool. This is where we get our functional programming. So if we have a stream of data coming in, we can map over it, we can filter over it. And this is all asynchronously as well. So if we have a call out to a website and it's just giving it data back when it happens to happen, or if there was an error, we get that passed back as well. Or if we send out a connection to three different websites and we don't care the order, we just want them all to come back and be processed and like map over a result set of going to a JSON endpoint. Um, we just get to act like it's an array. And um, a good way to describe these is with marble diagrams. Um, and there's a great set of documentation on ReactiveX IO. And these display kind of the input observable, if you've got some data coming in, and the, the operation that you apply to it, um, what would come out? And this is um, a delay operation, which doesn't change any of the data coming in. This uh, they represent data by colors and shapes, and then they show when it would come out at the end. And these are always terminating symbols. This is when the observable has uncompleted, and it shows up immediately as it can. So this is where it gets confusing. There's a few operations. I actually copied that in from their site, and it's a lot. It, it goes on. Um, so that's where it can be bad. Um, the documentation is mostly there, and they're working on um, deduping a lot of them because uh, there's a, across many languages, like being across the JavaScript, um, .NET. It's it's got a common language, but there's different like terminologies between all these different languages, and like they're they're finally bringing it together. So we've got kind of a, a common terminology for these operations, and the documentation is getting better. And one of the sites I like the most is tree. Um, it's a decision tree for observables. So you come here and you read through this large decision tree of, I've got an observable and I would like to do something with it. And you, you do start playing with this pattern and you used start act, asking these questions, and it's usually there. And then you go into the documentation for it, and you figure out how it works. And they've got these marble diagrams for it, so you can figure out fairly easily if this is the right thing you're looking for or if it was something else. And the names are fairly good at finding what you want. So their documentation is really coming along. It used to not be so great, especially these with the diagrams. All right. So here's where we get to metric collection. I just want to show off um, this little use case that we talked about a little bit. We've got a program we want to run on our servers that collects metrics. And one of the nuances of collecting metrics at a regular interval is what if your program that's collecting it, it starts eating up resources. Um, it's got a database connection that's leaky, or um, it's just taking a long time. You don't want to run a collection more than once, kind of like a cron job. I, I want to run this every five seconds, but I want to have a lock in front of that saying, like, if I'm still running from the previous five seconds, don't run. And when you're running lots of metric collections as well, there's an easy way to overload your server is by opening a ton of files for, like, opening 40 files for every service that's on there all at the exact same time. So it's good to display that across and then do five-second intervals, but not all at the same exact five seconds. So let's make it 
observable that just orchestrates that, that says, let's have a ticker that does our cron job. And if we're still busy from the last time, let's skip that. Uh, so I've got this in our manual ticker. This is kind of a diagram of what we want to build, uh, where we can say, start up at a random time between 0 and splace, um, do your first tick. And then after that, at a regular interval, do a tick. And then I'm going to give you a promise function, this uh, observable that I'm going to create. And the entire time this promise function is executing, it's going to finally get a value, but if a tick happens while you're still executing, don't, don't pass that on. Don't execute another version of that function. But once that promise returns, return the value into this final output stream, and then we can have another tick, and we'll start another promise. So how we might be able to compose something more interesting like this, and this is an observable uh, construct that isn't built into the massive list of what is available, but we could build that. So we'll go into our now familiar syntax of observable.create. And this is, a, this is a first take at building this ticker function, where it takes in a display, a period, and this, this promise returning function to call. And first off, let's um, just call this, let's have a run function that uh, knows if we're currently in flight. And if it is, it's just going to return. And then it will set in flight to true. And then it will call the promise. Uh, the function that returns a promise, um, take the value from the promise, put it onto our observer, and mark that we're no longer in flight. And to get the correct timing for that, we need to say, after this timeout for the first time, our random time to start, uh, we want a random delay, which we'll just do the math random display, and then we'll call that run function. And then we'll set an interval with our period to just continuously call that run function. And then finally, if ever we stop listening to this observable, we need to clear up those intervals so we're no longer like pulling the service. Um, we'll just put that in our cleanup function. So we can go into our metrics over here, node one, and to see this running along. The T's are ticks, and then uh, when it finished, and I can add one more thing. We might as well here uh, console.log. Executing. All right, so it got a tick. It's executing, and see this one was executing. Got a few more ticks, and then then it finished, and then it got another tick, and then it started executing. So there was this one that it skipped because it was still taking too long. And I've got this uh, timeout after five seconds to dispose of our subscription to this stream, and. It cleans up. It cleans up those uh, timeouts. So if we had multiple of these, it would uh, take care of all those different intervals. So here's where we start looking at more um, examples like you might see online. Instead of um, actually using the observable.create, a lot of the examples about how to use RxJS use RxJS to build other things. So they don't start with uh, observable.create. They start with something higher, like an observable timer. And it has this idea of a delay and a period. And this just sends an object down, kind of like we programmed manually before, after random time, and then after a period after that. And we can have this uh, do function after that, which is just uh, it's a side effecting function, um, where we can just log that we got a tick. And so we, from the timer, it's sending off these events, and we can filter through them, and say like, if we are currently in flight, we wanna, we don't wanna have, we don't wanna pass that event down. Um, and do another side effect to say, all right, we passed it, passed our filter. Now we are in flight. Now we want to uh, call our function, and when that is done with the stream, we want to say that we're no longer in flight. Um, it's got side effecting code in here with the do's, but the caller, it's still really easy. It's, uh, you, you call your ticker, you give it your function, you subscribe to it. And this is all about if you're going to create new observables for yourself, um, looking at the examples of how RxJX actually implements these, the state is needed. It's, it's about hiding it away from your application. This is a lot easier than managing what happens up in here with false or true uh, being in flight or not. And so 
The other thing to talk about it with this example is concat map. So I've got a ticker happening of intervals that are going across um, this timer. And then we're creating, essentially, an array of promises. Um, this is an observable itself. This is an observable itself. And we need to combine them all together and as one. And that's what concatmap does. And there's the uh, documentation for concatmap. So if you get a value in, and you have this function, it's a map. It can return one thing or multiple things. It will uh, put that on the output stream. And as it gets new things, it will put that on the output stream as they happen. So that's what we're using to combine the stream of streams into just one stream. And then we'll go just one more step up and do a ticker that uh, does oh, yeah, more than um, just showing off that we've got this correct Tron uh, working. And this time, we're going to um, pass in this function to a ticker, which is more interesting. And this is where we get to the, the make metric function. Um, this is what we're going to pass into our ticker. It's going to, every time it's called, it's going to execute for 100 milliseconds generating these metrics. It's going to be at our base, which is whatever. Uh, we, this would be a host name, a CPU, the disk, network memory. Um, a random value, and when it happened. And we're only going to return four metrics, but we're going to make 100 of these metric tickers. And we're going to make an array of all these observables. And we're going to look at what that, that output is. So I had a splay of right here. Uh, was What's that? Uh, sorry. Um, I had a display of 10 seconds. So that means it's going to take 10 seconds for all these to start running. And then once they are running, they're going to hit um, get ticked every second. So that's why it kind of speeds up. It's a little slower, a little slower. than they start all turning on. And then we're getting a ton of these values processing over. And they're all in this array. We, um, the result of our function, which is going out and like pulling a whole bunch of metrics for one instance, is an array. And what we'd want to do to pass this down to our output is smash that again into one stream, like where everything is just this object where it's a key value at and not these blobs of arrays. And that's a flat map. So let's run that really quickly. Thank you. So now we have everything in individual documents. And when you're actually going to be writing this stream of data out to somewhere, you don't want to keep a socket open that's writing things all the time. Um, if you're sending it to like HTTP or bundling things up, you, you want to packet things together. You want to optimize for your, your size. And there's another operation, of course, built in called buffer with time or count, saying I want a maximum of 15 seconds between the first item I see and bundling things over, or a maximum of 250 items. So it's saying it can really easily describe that I want my data fresh, like I'm collecting metrics, and I want to pipe it off to this downstream. Maximum I can keep it in memory is for 15 seconds or for until I get 250 of them. And then I'll send it downstream to get collected. And we'll just tack that on, and we'll get back into bundles. But they're going to be larger bundles. And this is something that we could pipe downstream. And that's collecting all those metrics um, at their individual rates. They can, they can turn off on their own. They can We can add new streams of metrics into this stream. and RxJS makes it really simple to describe the nuances of how to do the timing. Oh, we got to the code. All right. So here's where we get to the point where we talk about uh, WebSockets. And 
interactive demos, which is always a requirement when doing, I think, uh, these real-time streams. So if you could, on the internet, go to omgbbq.wtf with me. And you'll see something like this, which won't make too much sense, but it's uh, interactive. And uh, I've got a synth back here in the background that's rendering. And this is um, using tone.js. And it's a really easy way to compose incoming events into synthesizer events. And so everyone's got one button, and you just get to control of when it happens. <laughs> your uh, change events every time you change something. One side effect, even though there's someone still playing, is I can reload this and it immediately comes into where we were. Um, that's because we're finally using the last thing that we talked about, subjects, is it's a higher order construct that um, layers your observables that um, you can easily build in state. You can say, I, I want the last thing that was playing and I just want to bring it into me and it automatically handles the state for you um, if you use something. Um, like Meteor JS, where it handles like pushing the state to you, this is a really easy way to like wrap that up, and you don't have to worry about keeping the state yourself. It kind of manages it for you. Um, thank you for playing. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, subjects. Um, yeah, they're they're a weird name. I don't know. Um, how to describe them too well, except they, they are both an observer and an observable. You can pass them data, you can listen to them, and because of that, you can also wrap things around. And how the synthesizer was, like I reloaded it and it came on, it's because it was a subject that, as you pass it data, it remembers where it was, and if new people observe it, it passes you the last thing it knew, and then everything else that comes through it. Um, so here's links to the tools that I was able to use. Um, Reactive XIO is the main thing for documentation. Um, and I was challenged to write a haiku for us. Um, New Frankfurt region, so much work to prepare. Ping, mm, those pongs look nice. <laughs> so. Um, this was nice low latency. That was off my droplet in Frankfurt to do that uh, experiment. And um, thank you for letting us come and uh, talk with you. All right, thank you so much. Questions? Um, so there is another popular functional reactive programming framework out there. It's called BaconJS. Have you used it? And could you say something about the difference or what you would pre recommend? I haven't honestly given too much um, time with BaconJS. I've used a. I, I know they're very similar, and um, one of the things I think they were tr trying to work on is like RxJS is not very good for pushback. If um, you're trying to do like stream data, like reading a file, it is it's not very good at knowing. It's not me. <laughs> it, it's not good at knowing um, when the downstream is good. When when you're producing a bunch of data and your consumer is slow, reactive 
uh, RX is RxJS is not very good at knowing how to do that, how to back off. Um, the solution is kind of to stop listening and say that I'm too busy and um, otherwise write your own like feedback loop to say like producer slow down I'm I'm too busy stop making stuff but I, I've seen some with um, I'm not sure if it was with bacon or with um, there, there's another reactive one whose sole purpose was to try to solve that problem that slow consumers would make the producer match their speed sorry <laughs> Convoluted answer to uh, I have I haven't used bacon. <laughs> this mic is screwed. <laughs> Remix. Um, what I was actually going to ask before I got remixed <laughs> is, uh, are you using IOJS? Or? I am, yeah. Okay. Um, and just out of personal interest, is DigitalOcean using IOJS, or is this something you do on your side projects? This was only a, a side project. That's why I was so heavy on the ES6-isms, because I wanted to let that into my life. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you feel? It feels great. Damn. <laughs> um, one thing I did have to do since you asked about IO um, JS, I'm still on here. Um, uh, what is it? Are you still on yesterday's version or are you up to date? I, I, I installed this uh, today, so it might be out of date. <laughs> um, I had to have this Harmony classes because I'm, it's not built in some of the ES6 feature, uh, features, um, but there was a flag with IOJS that I could just turn it on. So I didn't have to do any transpiling with that code, it was just put in. And is this kind of stuff being used by uh, or at DigitalOcean, or is this a kind of a proof of concept that you're doing if that it could replace a sort of system D on hundreds of droplets thing? Oh, I thought you were going to ask about the music, but. Um, this is a system that I very much had at my previous job um, with uh, MongoHQ. This is actually how we ran our stack collection across many Mongo clusters. And we've got a very similar system that is not using RxJS at uh, DigitalOcean. OK, any other questions? Not really a question, but something interesting that popped up in my mind. Uh, back in the days, I was listening to a talk by some guy from Netflix. He was giving a talk on how to build uh, user interfaces with functional reactive programming. I can recommend that to everyone. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it's it, it's really related to, uh, to this event. I think um, since this has been like a lot of basically Node.js server-side example, I think it's also great to uh, think about how, what, what, how we can use this in the front end. Yeah, um, it's, it's a great talk, and he's given that much better than I ever could, so I wanted to focus on different content, and it's on YouTube. It's a great talk. All right, that's it then. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks.